All right, we're here after the sermon. It is uh, May 23rd, and we just got finished with a message from Exodus chapter 7 through Exodus chapter 10 on the plagues of Egypt, and we're going to do those over the course of the next two sermons. Darkness is next week, and then we're going to do the Passover the week after that, which falls on the Lord's Supper, which is really a great time to talk about the Passover That's and awesome. to deal with that. So uh, it's almost like it was planned. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, we, we talked about the judgment of God and what these plagues teach mm-hmm. us, really four lessons about the judgment of God, what it does. It teaches us that, that there's only one God, and that's God. Uh, it teaches us about um, there's nobody like God. God is God. There's no other. Third, it teaches us about the sovereignty of God. And then fourth, these these judgments have an evangelistic purpose. So you guys had some questions from the yeah, long had, message. This I had morning. one. Um, we haven't really talked about it a lot, but it seems like this whole hardening of Pharaoh's heart mm-hmm. is a big deal. Yeah, it and, is. Um, a lot of, can you just can you explain that whole situation for <laughs> us and for all those who are watching? What exactly is going on there? And how do we think about that? I can give it my best shot. Okay. Okay. So one of the things that people often will will say in that when as you read this read this certain section of Exodus here, where God says at the beginning, "I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart," because, and He's not going to let the people go. And then there are points within that text where it seems like Pharaoh is going to let the people go mm-hmm. and then God hardens his heart again. And so then some of us may read that and think, well, wow, God is just really toying with Pharaoh here. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's, he's really going after Pharaoh. Um, and Pharaoh is just trying his best just to, just to let the people go and obey God and um, all, all, of, all of that is, is what's happening. And then all of a sudden God is just standing in the way and then he stops Pharaoh from being obedient, which is not true at all, yeah. by the way. God never stops anybody from being obedient. Mm-hmm. The issue at hand is there, there's, there's a judgment taking place upon Pharaoh. Yeah. Pharaoh mm-hmm. has exalted himself above God. He has said, who is Yahweh that I should obey him? That, that's, that's his first mistake. And the second thing is God is not having grace and mercy upon Pharaoh at all. He is under God's judgment and wrath. It is a done deal. There's no, there's no opportunity for, for Pharaoh to be saved here. So when Pharaoh is actually saying, okay, take the people and go, he's not doing this by faith. Mm-hmm. He, he's not doing this in submission to God because he loves God with, with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He's mm-hmm. doing this to get himself off the hook yeah. at this point. And he thinks that's going to get him off the hook and give him opportunity now to kind of regroup mm-hmm. And then go back and get the, the Israelite slaves again. He, he's not fully defeated at that point, mm-hmm. and so we need to we need to remember that when we're going through this text. Now, the the second thing we need to remember when going through this text is God is the one who changes hearts. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the one who hardens hearts at, at times. He's also the one who kind of backs off and allows that heart to harden on its own, because uh, that's what the natural progression of a heart would be anyway. That's under sin and, and judgment, mm-hmm. and so um, God is not allowing at that point Pharaoh to decide when and where. Mm-hmm. And he's not decide, He's not allowing Pharaoh to decide when this war is over. Mm-hmm. Um, he's going to completely destroy Pharaoh before it's all over. There's going to be any opportunity whatsoever for Egypt and Pharaoh to come back and to bring the Israelites back into captivity. So this is not an arbitrary act on God's part. This is God accomplishing his purposes in the life of his people. And he does this for, for their good and for his glory and not for the good mm-hmm. of Pharaoh, and not for the good of the Egyptians either. Mm-hmm. So we may get a little uncomfortable with that, but that's what the Bible teaches. So God is perfectly able to do that, and it's and God is the one who created the heart, mm-hmm. and therefore He's sovereign over even that. That's weird when you think about because what you just said was exactly what's going on there, right? God is using Pharaoh for His purposes. Mm-hmm. When we hear that phrase, God using for His purposes, we think of Moses, we think of mm-hmm. we think of evangelists, we think of us, you know, who right. have nothing to offer. But God uses us to make His name great. Mm-hmm. We always think of it in a redemptive sense, a gracious sense. Yeah. Here you see the opposite of that: God using someone to accomplish His work, to make His name great, to demonstrate, but not His grace and mercy, mm-hmm. His other attributes that are still fully His yeah. attributes, and um, we're a lot less comfortable with that idea. Yeah. I wonder if part of this too, like, I know I tend to, my mind thinks, until someone has died, there's always a chance, right? right. My mind, it's, it's kind of like almost, almost this neutrality. Until mm-hmm. you hit the grave, there's always this kind mm-hmm. of this option there. But what we're seeing in this story is that um, yes and no. From our perspective, we have no idea if someone might come to the Lord. But mm-hmm. from God's perspective, He has called His own. Mm-hmm. 
and he has passed over those who he has created for judgment. Mm -hmm. And we just get to see that from a different perspective that is really uncomfortable at times. That's a good segue into the question I had, which was, okay, there, there is no hope of salvation for Pharaoh that's been made abundantly clear through, through yeah. several different points. Mm -hmm. um, should we then, today, should I ever be afraid that maybe there is no hope of salvation for me, or maybe if I'm a believer and I have a lost friend, should I ever fear there is no hope of salvation for them? You know, what I, what I would say to that is there's no way for us to know that. All right, so for Pharaoh, we, had, we have divine revelation that teaches us that. Moses had divine revelation that showed him that before he ever walks into that, that situation. God tells him up front, I'm going to harden his heart. I'm not going to let the people, let the people go. And, and I'm going to show my name to be powerful in all the earth. Mm -hmm. So he knows that going in. So that's a particular person at a particular place at a particular time. So unless we have divine revelation that says that this person doesn't have a chance, that this person is under God's um, judgment and wrath where he's not going to save them, then we can't say that. So I would, I would be very cautious in, in mm -hmm. consigning someone um, to God's eternal judgment and wrath and hell mm -hmm. when God hasn't told us that, uh, that specifically. So I would say, and, and just as a, you know, we all struggle through this, so yeah. let, me, let, me, let me say it this way. When do you stop sharing the gospel with somebody? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's really the issue at hand. When that person says to you, Stop sharing the gospel with me. Stop trying to push your religion onto me. Stop trying to evangelize me. I think we have to honor that. I think that's that's them saying to us, look, we don't want to hear it anymore. I'm not interested. And then I think our response has to be, well, okay, I'll, I'll honor your wishes, but if you ever have a question or you want to talk about it, I'm open. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna press this on you anymore, mm -hmm. and and leave it at that. And then and continue to pray for them. I mean, that's the person that you love and you care for. You continue to pray that God would open their heart, that he would change their heart, that he would save them, that he would let them understand the gospel. So I'd say, I'd say no, there's no way for us to know that. You know, we got those, those cases in Scripture. And then, you know, I, I mentioned Revelation chapter 5 where the, where the heaven, the host of heaven are singing about the judgment of God that's being poured out on the earth. That's because they had divine revelation that the people that are on earth at that time were coming under the wrath and judgment of God in a much in a very similar way to what happened to to, e to Egypt and mm -hmm. Pharaoh. Was it, you go look at the plagues that were poured out from those seals, yeah. very similar to the ones that were poured out in, in Exodus as well. So uh, again, it's divine revelation that teaches us. Yeah, I just had a um, I want this might not make sense, so I'm just going to throw it out there and keep on correcting it. <laughs> but there, to your question, John, kind of what Pastor Joe was talking about, like Moses came to Pharaoh multiple times, mm -hmm. um, even though the end was already known. But right. he came, you think about Jonah going to Nineveh. You know, destruction was there for Nineveh. They repented, but they fell later on. But mm -hmm. there was, but um, you know, Jesus goes to Jerusalem and calls him again and again and again. Like there's this, even knowing, even when those who have revelation into the final outcome, doesn't prevent the act of obedience and declaring. Right. So I, I mean, even if we knew, like somehow, what someone's destiny was or someone's decision was, there is still that act of obedience proclaiming the gospel to them. Because even that, that's what God uses to break their hearts, but it's also part of the judgment that comes against them for having heard. So I don't, just thinking through that, I don't know. Yeah, you know, that's one of the arguments against uh, the doctrine of predestination and election is because they'll say, well, so Jesus, weeps over Jerusalem, right? And he, and he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how, how I would love to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. And they focus in on that you would not part as if that cancels election and predestination. <laughs> it doesn't. No. We, we know Shucks. everybody who goes to hell goes to hell, goes under the judgment of God because that's what they want. Yeah. Now, they may not say that, but their refusal to bow the knee to, bow the knee to Christ, to, to submit themselves to God, only brings that about. That's what they desire. Just like in Romans 1, the passage that I read in the middle of the sermon where it says, although they knew God, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't honor him as God. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we need to remember that as we're dealing with predestination and election and yeah. all those things. Nobody goes to hell that doesn't, doesn't deserve it, and then nobody goes to hell that doesn't want to be there. Yeah. They chose it. God didn't choose it for them. Given the options, they made that choice. That's right. And also, you know, talking about the revelation, the, what's happening in Exodus is the hidden will of God is being revealed That's right. and becoming visible to uh, Moses and then to Pharaoh himself and to all of us reading it. But 
what we're saying is the hidden will of God for each individual person is still hidden mm -hmm. because unless you have in the Bible revelation that says, well, this person is not elect, but, mm -hmm. but we don't have that mm -hmm. for our friends, for our family, for ourselves. Right. And so what we do have mm -hmm. in the revealed will of God is him saying, listen, I desire that all men everywhere may come to repentance, meaning all men from every tribe, mm -hmm. language, and tongue, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so salvation we could say, as far as it's been revealed to us, is on the docket for everyone we speak to now, yeah. and in, including ourselves. Um, yeah. There you go. Gospel's a command before it's an offer. Yeah. yeah. Repent is a, is a command. Believe the gospel is a command. I think we've got time for one more. Send 14. Let me throw one out. Um, so, you talked about judgment. Um, well, that was, the, that was the whole sermon, actually. Yeah. It's talked about it a lot. <laughs> um, but you kind of began with just being uncomfortable, yeah. kind of the first stop and be denied, and talked about how in Scripture it's actually celebrated, or a psalm is celebrated, but then also said we should be very uncomfortable with it. And there seems to be some kind of paradox tension there, like it's something that should be terrifying to us, but also we should be singing about um, and rejoicing in. Like, that seems hard for me to bring that together. Yeah. You know, if you just, just thinking about that question and the tension that obviously is there yeah so one of the things that we have to remember is that judgment wrath and anger are, are attributes of god mm -hmm. so god is his attributes i mean he's not just having these attributes he is his attributes so holiness mercy grace love you know omnipresence omniscience mm -hmm. are, are all part of that and then we celebrate all of that right okay. and we tend to get nervous about judgment wrath and anger Really, what we should be getting nervous about, I think, is his omnipresence and his omniscience. Because if all of God is everywhere at all times, he's with us every moment. I mean, there's never a moment where God is not fully present with yeah. us. Um, there, there's not any. There's never been a time in, in eternity where God learned anything. I mean, he, he's omniscient. He knows everything. Yeah. He just decreed everything. Mm -hmm. Though those things, the holiness of God, mm -hmm. should make us far more nervous than the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, we we tend to avoid the wrath and judgment of God and the anger of God because we don't want that. Yeah. And somehow we're comfortable with all these other things, which bring that holding that wrath, anger, and justice about. So, um, yeah, th there should be tension in all of that. We, we just sang, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, right at the end. That should terrify us. I, I don't think it's that foreign of an idea in our human experience, because when you look at, you imagine a courtroom scene mm -hmm. where there's a man who has clearly murdered someone, mm -hmm and the family grieving and mm -hmm. saddened and maybe a whole, maybe it's one of those things where a whole community or even the whole country has come mm -hmm. behind and say how, how could this have happened what is going on here um and when the judgment comes down for that person that they're found guilty and maybe mm -hmm. they get the death penalty or whatever the the family and maybe the community and the nation celebrates mm -hmm. that that judgment yeah. and, and it would be foolish to say oh that's so sad that we that, that that was the case. No, 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 no. That this is a good thing because mm -hmm. justice is a is a good thing. Yeah. And you might even I, I can even imagine a courtroom where you uh, see cheering. Mm -hmm. What's difficult is when we think of the wrath of God, we don't think of it happening to people who deserve it. Right. Mm -hmm. But we all deserve oh, it. That's good. It's a just thing. Um, yeah, that we we send for whatever reason. It, I do it too. We forget that justice is good. Mm -hmm. We we really we really do forget yeah. that. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all the time we have. So hopefully we don't leave everybody completely confused over that last question. Your question, <laughs> Pastor Joe. That's right. <laughs> all right. We'll see you guys next week. God willing. Bless you.